Hello again, it's Jonathan at the Piano Lesson. Hope you're all doing well. Um, there's a song, a standard, called There'll Never Be Another You, which I happened to be teaching the other day. Um, I teach a very nice fellow uh, over in Spain. I teach people all over the world. It's exciting what the internet can do. And uh, one of my great students, uh, Pedro, uh, who uh, happens to live in Spain. I've been teaching him for many years. Great guy. Used to live in Switzerland. He's originally from Portugal. But we're lear learning there'll never be another you. And one of the great things about teaching and learning tunes is that you start to um, relearn them and start to really uh, see the, the, the beauty in them. And, and uh, I'm, I'm rambling a little bit right now, but I, I love... I, I love teaching music theory, and I love music theory because it allows me to understand the piece as a whole, comprehensively. That's really what music theory is supposed to give you. know, the word theory, if you ask, well, what is a theory? Is, is a theory true or false? Is, it a, is, it, is, a, is a theory a fact? And the answer is yes, it is a fact, but it's a big fact. It is actually a compilation or an amalgamation of facts that have been tested and tested over and over and over again till they become accepted. And, you know, the, the, typically the, the many things that uh, would, would uh, require a theoretical understanding, and those ideas are so big and so vast that no one can really test them all to infinity, but we test them as best we can. But music theory, um, it has certain rules and you learn, you know, what a scale is called and what a chord is called and, and, and lots of uh, nomenclature and techno uh, te te technical words. But, you know, the, the thing that makes uh, a great piece of music great, a thing that makes a great composer great, is that the piece, it's the piece itself, great, a great piece of music, is a uh, cohesive. You could look at it from any angle, any vantage point, and it would hold up. And that's also why it lends itself to a great performance uh, and, and a multitude of performances. And likewise, a great composer, I believe, really understands all of the music as if it were one note or one idea. You know, they, they kind of see it from, from a satellite image, you know, and they can go down and look at it like Jacques Cousteau under the water and look at it on a microscopic level or whatever. But uh, so I'd like to talk about this tune, There'll Never Be Another You, uh, in a way that would help you understand the melody. Uh, a lot of these these tunes are de deceptively simple. You know, um, the, the chords themselves, the, the, the melodies themselves are not necessarily that tough, really. But that's the thing that kind of traps us because there are exceptions to the rule and it's the exceptions that kind of uh, trip us up. So the, the, the tune, there'll, there'll Never Be Another You, um, it's, in, it's, it's in E flat and uh, melody is. Now I wanna mention something, this tune was Actually, originally written in the 1940s. I'm trying to get my information up here. It was originally written in, uh, what was it, 1942. Yes, it was for a movie called Iceland. <laughs> and it was the story of a, um, a U.S. serviceman, a U.S. Marine who was stationed in Iceland. Okay, that's what they wrote about back then. That's what the movie's about, the war. It was written by Harry Warren, one of the great uh, composers of, of all time. And... Matt Gordon wrote the words, and it's one of the reasons why I love Wikipedia. And I know some people don't, but I do, uh, because you just go to the Wikipedia page of There'll Never Be Another You, and you get this branch of information, and you can find out who wrote the music, and who wrote the words, and what movie it was from, and what year, and who acted in it. And you can really go you know, down this rabbit hole and learn all kinds of fascinating information. And, and all of them are important. We really need to know who these people are, and I could go on and on about who these people are, uh, but I don't have the time to do that <laughs> necessarily. Uh, but just to give you an idea, so Harry Warren, uh, he was nominated 
for uh, many Academy Awards, with Academy Award for Best Original Song, 11 times. I mean, that's pretty good, isn't he? He wrote Lullaby of Broadway. If you don't know Lullaby of Broadway, da 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 the Lullaby of Broadway, fantastic, iconic song of the Broadway era. And Mac Gordon, Mac Gordon, uh, lyricist, also uh, nominated for Best Original Song uh, uh, Oscar nine times in 11 years. And uh, in the 1940s, but he wrote the words to You'll Never Know. And uh, so, you know, in, in fact, I have a, a friend of mine who is an heir to one of these songwriting fortune families. <laughs> he was telling me the other day how he's getting all these checks from, you know, uh, his, these uh, uh, residuals, these, these co not, co co not residuals, co copyright, um, you know, uh, money that he's getting from these songs. One of, one of the songs is Don't Sit Under the Apple Tree. I mean, people are still playing Don't Sit Under the Apple Tree with anyone else, but people are still playing these songs you know, gosh, almost, uh, I don't know, 80 years later, 90 years later, whatever. Uh, and they're still raking in money. Incredible. I mean, they were songwriting juggernauts. So um, anyway, the the songs in, in the key of E flat, it was originally also played very slowly. Di da 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 di da ba da da da. You listen to Go to YouTube and listen to the original um, uh, cut of that song, uh, and you'll you'll hear how slow it is. This tune is often played very quickly, though, and much much quicker. I mean, it's often let's put it this way: it's often never played like a ballad. It's almost a ballad, really. So it shows you how far afield we've we've gotten from the original score. And that's not to say that it's a bad idea to play it at a faster tempo, but you know, it's so easy to, it's almost like, again, the telephone game where these this, these bits of information just very quickly just get uh, twisted and distorted, you know, so we don't even know what the original song is. But the the, the, the song is, and they're all quarter notes. It's a great song to learn. It's a very easy now, what kind of scale does that sound like? Now, listen. It almost sounds like a wrong note, doesn't it? That's the first half of the tune. That's the first 16 bars, and then it does it again. And then the ending. <laughs> ending is pretty straightforward. Right? That's the last eight bars of the song. So typical 32 bar tune. So what's all, what what scale does that sound like? I well, uh, it's it's a penta, it's really a pentatonic scale. It's like the black keys on the piano, okay? This in E flat it would be would be this. E flat F G B flat C. And it sounds kind of Asian, but that's really the the scale. Now what they've done with this scale and I'll, I'll let you see what it looks like, but this is this is the scale, okay? And when I learn a piece of music, when I learn a tune, I just try to get the gist of it. You know what I mean by the gist? Just like, you know, the general overall sound of the tune. E flat, F, G, uh, B flat, C. Okay, and then of course, we're, if you want to do another E flat up there, that's fine, but that would be an E flat major pentatonic. Okay, what makes it a pentatonic? Well, penta means five, there's five notes, okay? So one, two, three, those are the scale degrees, five, six, and then we're back to the, the one again. Now, what makes the song interesting? Well, 
they've created a mode in effect of of the tune so they've they've framed the song not start the song doesn't start on e flat it actually starts on uh what are we yeah it was it, it actually starts on um b flat it starts there e, d, it's b flat c and then a d and then an e flat now it almost sounds like there's our there's our kind of pentatonic well right right over here here's here's it's kind of like a mode a mode of of that pentatonic scale so rather than this taking the same notes and reframe them all right move them down here that's really the sound you want to get in in your head okay um, this little group here happens to be a tetrachord all of its own it, that that is that's a b flat major tetrachord all right so that's a little and the thing that stands out that's not part of the pentatonic scale is the is the d you have the you have b flat C, D, and E flat, but the D here, that's the that's that's the the leading tone in the major scale. What's that doing there? If I if I said it's a pentatonic scale, what's the D doing there? Well it's kind of it's kind of an exception, it's up front. See there there's your pentatonic Now what happened here? There's an A flat. That's not in the pentatonic scale. Now to watch this. D natural. Here's your. There's the. There's A natural. That's the wrong note. It finally gets to the A flat. So the the real interesting thing about this is that it it's it's it. Is, is that it it uses this a natural and then five of five and then five that's pretty cool now keep that a natural in mind that's that's a, a really important extra note e flat f g a flat a natural okay b flat c and then we'll just put a d a D in there, okay. Um, so here's the scale. All right. Do you guys remember that at all from um, any of the the Barry Harris lessons? Okay. He has this uh, thing about his this this scale with an extra note, and he gets very angry at Mozart and shakes his fist at him. He said Mozart lied, and this, the scale doesn't have seven notes; it has eight notes. Okay. But he sticks in an extra note in his scale. Um, the name of the scale that he uses kind of uh, escapes me at the moment. You can help me out, but it's a, what, what is it? A uh, diminished six, he calls it a diminished six scale, which is kind of a odd name. Um, so why, what's that extra note doing there? It's kind of like it allows a certain amount of chromaticism. So when you're, when you're learning the scale, right, you're, you're learning the diatonic harmonies that go with that and it's typically E flat major, F minor, G minor, A flat major, B flat major, C minor, D diminished, then E flat major. Um, well what he does here is he adds an extra that A natural implies the A diminished and F7 that's five of five, F7 is is five of five in the key of E flat because five is is B flat right one two three four five F is a fifth above B flat but the top part of that dominant chord the top part of that of of that of that dominant chord F uh, A C E flat right the top part here is is a diminished that's the that's the A diminished chord right there and it leads leads to the b flat all right so 
then you can you can take that idea and rather than starting on E flat, start it on a B flat. And there's your scale. So if you want to learn this tune, we've created, we've kind of created a let's call it a customized scale. Okay, but that really is the sound of, of the tune in essence. Now I said it was pentatonic. That's another aspect of the song too. So there, there is this sort of pentatonic quality it has, but then the thing that makes it interesting and, and a little bit tough is that it also does have this you know, major scale quality to it. And when you when you going down that sounds like a run out. Here's your A flat. That could be F minor seven two five. Now watch what I do with the diatonic triads. Right? I use the same diatonic chords but starting on the B flat. So I've created kind of a mode of that, almost, almost, let's call it a mixolydian mode, okay, of, of that. And we've added that extra note, so now we have an eight note scale. Now, here's what it would sound like. Would it sound like that? <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, so the melody is so here's what with when you add chords. Um, right? That's how you harmonize the melody. This, I mean I'm, I'm this is an eleven chord, but basically it's it's a dominant, it's B flat seven dominant. And then you here I'm playing C minor. Now C minor is the relative minor of E flat. It's effectively E flat anyway, if you have a bass note. The G minor can be understood as a first inversion E flat, potentially. A flat major, diminished. This is the, um, I lost it there for a second. Could be five one, right? Alternating between tonic and dominant, uh, dominant tonic, dominant tonic, uh, and then thi this this might be could be an F seven, but could be several different different options. Dominant. Uh, um, and then, um, oh, dominant five one. Sometimes the easy, the easiest chords are the ones that are most elusive. Yeah. So five one. I'm going to call this five, even though it's minor, F minor seven two one five one. And now this part goes to the relative minor, C minor, D minor seven flat five, G seven. Now it starts back on E flat, the tonic, but it sounds minor because it's we have the C in the bass. Could be D flat seven with a sharp eleven. F seven. That's the thirteen. There's the A natural. There's your A flat. Now I'm trying to make this chord a little bit simpler, you know, so it get the point across. Um, I'm just gonna play a little bit.
fun little tune, isn't it? Um, so it starts in E flat. It goes to the relative minor. Then it goes to the subdominant, to A flat. And then 5 of 5, F, and then 5. Not, not too hard. And then the second time it does something very similar. Uh, sometimes you see F minor 7 flat 5. That doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me, frankly, because that F minor 7 flat 5, uh, but the reason they have that is because it's, it's D flat, uh, 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 D flat 7 sharp 11. Now, D flat is the tritone substitution for G. That could work, potentially G7, you know. It sounds interesting. I wouldn't, I probably wouldn't play F minor 7 flat 5. You know, that does like a real book chord. That's, uh, that doesn't make any sense. I mean, I don't, I don't get that really. Um, I get D flat or G7 sharp 5. I don't know. What I like actually, here's an idea A flat. G7 sharp 5, then E flat in first inversion because you got the G in the bass. And then real book chord is G minor, C7, possible, but um, it, I just hear it as F, F7, and then B flat in the bass, D7, G, C, F. B flat or E7. But this sound, if you're going to practice pentatonic major and doing the diatonic chords that kind of track to that and adding that extra note in also, right? So here's pentatonic with the A natural. Here's a major scale. That makes more sense to me. So the Barry Harris thing would be E. Um, yeah. We'll do. Or maybe. Diminished, or the, could could be an F seven. Um, going up the scale, but maybe starting an E flat. That makes more sense. You got to mess around with it a little bit. I haven't played this tune in a while. You could probably hear that. Um, but you know, as you keep playing it, it gets better, and it kind of makes more sense, and you experiment. You know, that's that's the fun of it. It's, you know, again, we're not learning Mozart. It doesn't have to be perfect. You can kind of just, if you haven't played a tune in a while, just thrash about, <laughs> you know, and, and do the best you can and get through it a few times. And, and then you're like, oh, yeah, I can. I, but, yeah, I kind of like that. Sounds like the beginning of a... Broadway musical, doesn't it? That's the A natural. Diminished. F7, flat 9. Or well, that's B flat uh, in the bass with the A natural against it. That sounds interesting. Right? We're just kind of meandering around today, kind of goofing around. So uh, anyway, I hope you kind of enjoyed that. You know, the, what's the moral of the story? If you're learning a tune, um, kind of get into it and uh, see if you can understand it on a more of a global level. This is as far as I've gotten with this tune, you know, just trying to understand it in terms of generalizations 
looking at the exceptions, getting more, and then getting more specific, okay? But, you know, music is simpler than it seems, but I'm not saying it's easy, right? But it's, it's a matter of taking a simple idea and looking at it from a, another vantage point. Anyway, we're going to wrap it up today. That's Jonathan at the Piano Lesson. Hope you had a good time. And until next week, uh, arrivederci. <laughs>